Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lipman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. And you know, we always take our show topics from you, the audience. And uh, people ask us about something called sepsis, the causes, the treatment, and prevention. And uh, I have two experts here. I have Dr. Jill Wallace-Ross, who is the Assistant Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine, the Karan C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine. And uh, she's uh, the Assistant Dean for Clinical Education. She's sitting right in front of me. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Lippman. It's a Good. pleasure to be here. Good. And uh, someone that you've seen a number of times when we were talking about Zika, you remember? Yes. And, uh, you know, everybody's forgotten the Zika crisis, but uh, it's still around. And it's Dr. Bindu Mai, uh, who is a professor of microbiology in the College of Medical Sciences. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Good to have you. So, Dr. Wallace Ross, what is sepsis? Thank you for asking. So, sepsis is an overall response of the body to infection to the point where there is end organ damage or damage to the body in ways um, that sometimes can be fixed and sometimes can't be fixed. There's a whole cascade of um, responses in the body to an infection that occur and as a result these the normal processes in the body go awry in a variety of ways. So what happens with sepsis is somebody gets an infection and it starts to affect the entire body and a lot of the different organ systems in ways that can cause damage that are not expected when you first see somebody with a fever or a sore throat. So Dr. Bindumai, uh, you know, uh, you're a professor of microbiology, but I, I see uh, in essence the issues of microbiology really also garnering the, the required knowledge of biochemistry. You're absolutely right. So I'll start out by saying that was a great way of putting it, put it, describing sepsis. So the old definitions, definition is important because it allows, it gives us direction to go towards. So the old definition used to be that sepsis is a systemic inflammatory response syndrome that is created by the host that responds to the infection. And this response is insufficient to clear the infection. So in 2016, understanding that definition is so critical to give us, to point us towards care, in 2016, Europe, um, the European Society of Critical Care Medicine and Intensive Care Medicine convened about 19 specialists in pulmonology, surgery, infectious disease, and critical care, and came up with a new definition. And the new definition says that sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction that is due to a dysregulated host response to infection. So much is packed into that definition. What it tells us is it's life-threatening, yes. What it tells us is that the organs start failing and why the organs start failing is because there is a dysregulated response from our body towards the infection. So this definition points us towards better care. And why did we come up with this new definition? Precisely what you asked me. We understand so much more about the pathobiology of the infection. So we understand better the immunology, the microbiology, the biochemistry, the organ system itself, how it functions, what its morphology is, the circulatory system, all of this uh, contributes to pathobiology. So with this new understanding, we've come up with this new definition and it points us towards better diagnostics because we realize that we have to diagnose quickly. If we speed up our diagnostics, then we also speed up um, how quickly we treat the patient, and that really exponentially um, increases the resolution rate. You know, uh, this is something, the reason I brought this topic to the show is because we've had, a, a, you know, our viewers are pretty interested in things. They hear something, oh, so and so, my my brother, my my sister, my child, whatever, ends up in a hospital, you know, with whatever a a, a cut or gash or whatever, or they were in a, a a fall, an accident, and all of a sudden, you know, something's gone wrong, 
and uh, and the doctor says your your person, your child, your brother, your sister, whatever has sepsis, and and they asked me the question, what is sepsis, and that's why I brought you here, Doctor Joe Wallace Ross. Uh, you know, I would assume that the, the normal natural intervention into treating sepsis is starting to use certain antibiotics and things of that nature. So let's talk about it. Sure. So it, with sepsis, the first part that, uh, that Dr. Mai was talking about in terms of defining what sepsis is, is identifying that somebody is at risk for it or does have it. So uh, we would like to try to prevent it and catch people who are at risk beforehand. However, if somebody does have sepsis, there's a lot of treatment that would go into the care. Um, with the understanding that it is of an infectious nature, if the specific bacteria can be identified um, by doing blood cultures or other tests, and we have rapid tests now that can help to identify the specific organism, then yes, the appropriate antibiotics would be provided to help to get rid of that infection bacterials could potentially be viral or otherwise. Um, in addition to that, because the organ systems have damage, there may be need for a lot of other things, especially fluids. When you have the damage to the um, blood vessels themselves, they become very leaky. So you need to make sure that the person has enough fluid within their blood system in order to provide circulation. So generally, somebody would need antibiotics, um, fluids, their blood pressure may be low, so they might need um, medicines to increase their blood pressure. Their respiratory rate may be so decreased that they need outside assistance to help with breathing um, and need to have intubation or um, other external help with breathing. Um, and any other issues that occur, if there's kidney damage, somebody might need dialysis. If there's liver damage, they may need medications to help treat that component. So depending on the outcome for that individual patient, the treatment would be centered around that. But it's very team-oriented and multifactorial in the approach as there are so many components that can happen and so many organ systems that can be affected by sepsis. You know, I, I just, I can relate to, to exactly what you're saying because I, I had a, uh, very close friend who um, was on a an escalator, and uh, somehow a piece of luggage slipped, and he went to get it, and he came down on the escalator, and gashed his thigh. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, entered the hospital. They did what they had to do, but after a couple of days, the the gash was you know. I don't know what to say, but ugly. Mm -hmm. So they started to, to, to debreed it, but that was the beginning of a sepsis involvement. And uh, he, he was, I think he was very, very fortunate in the fact that they had a very valuable uh, infectious disease doctor inside that hospital. If it wasn't for that ID person, that infectious disease person, my friend would not be alive today. So really, Dr. Mai, what what's happening is it, it 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 involved all of the entities that you enumerated, because it isn't just knowing what the organism is. It has you have to know what the organism organism has done to certain organs in the body, because the body is only trying to protect itself. Correct. Right. right. You're Go ahead. absolutely right. It's all yours. Um, so I, I do want to continue with Dr. Jill Wallace Ross said. Um, the therapies itself are pretty complex. What that means is you need aggressive early antibiotic intervention, and typically that's a broad spectrum antibiotic. Um, you have vasopressors, to, um, and also you have to address the hypotension. Um, so fluid resuscitation. So all of this adds to the cost of healthcare. Oftentimes, uh, patients with sepsis also have a prolonged stay in the hospital, specifically in the ICU. So if you consider just our healthcare costs here in the United States for sepsis patients, it exceeds $20 billion in a year. That's a lot of money. And 
more than 60% of patients will get re-hospitalized within 30 days. And that alone, that re-hospitalization alone costs over $2 billion. So there's a lot of care that goes into addressing a patient with sepsis while they are fighting sepsis. But there is something that happens beyond resolution. So let's say a patient comes in with sepsis, is addressed, is cured of the sepsis incident. What happens afterwards is oftentimes they are left with long-term consequences, physical, psychological sometimes, cognitive disabilities, and all of these have significant implications when you consider healthcare and maybe even their social interactions. Um, there, there was a paper that came out in 2016 in JAMA Psychiatry that uh, found a link between infections that you see in sepsis and the development of psychiatric disorders and also suicidal behavior. So we of course need to do more studies to really investigate how strong this linkage is and what, what does this mean for us to follow up with these patients. Um, but we are learning a lot now about what exactly sepsis is. And what that means for us is we can intervene early, but we can also follow up and provide care as and when needed. You know, it, it's very interesting because, uh, again, I, I refer to this person that I've, that I've known for a long time. And it's been a seven month battle. And I can understand, you know, intellectually, psychologically, and otherwise, how, how heavy that is on the individual's psyche. This whole issue of sepsis, the reason I, I, I wanted to bring it to the people out here is because I, we've heard so many uh, comments from individuals. You know, we all hear of the elderly having, you know, seeping wounds and what otherwise, which are based upon the aging of the the, the aging process, but sepsis is so concomitant with active adults mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that we've heard it about, I can't believe my son has been, you know, hospitalized five times, six times. I can't believe my niece has been hospitalized 10 times over the last eight months. And those are the comments that we heard. So I figured, well, let's talk about sepsis. Mm -hmm. It's not a very, you know, it's not something that's normally talked about, but, you know, that's what this program is all about. Dr. Jill Wallace-Ross, go ahead. So one of the, I'm glad that you brought this topic up because I think that there is a big misconception about who is at risk for sepsis, that we tend to think of a skin wound, first and foremost, that it has to come from an actual cut, that the bacteria um, has to come in from that point of entry, um, which is how it can happen, but not the only way it can happen. And there's a whole host of vulnerable populations that exist that are not just the elderly. And just because someone is elderly doesn't necessarily mean that they're at risk just because they have an advanced age. So some of the things that would predispose somebody to be at risk for sepsis are other things that would be wrong with their immune system. So for instance, if there is an immune deficiency of any kind, whether it's an acquired deficiency, like something like HIV, or something that was an, you know, that they were born with an immune deficiency, because there are a few um, genetic ones of those, that would be something that would put them at risk for sepsis because their body doesn't have the ability to fight off the infection as robustly as somebody who has a healthy immune system. Likewise, somebody who has diabetes. Say you have a six-year-old child who is diagnosed with diabetes. It's not because of their, their diet, it's because of their pancreas doesn't work. But the effect of diabetes on the body affects the immune system. And so, and the damage that happens with too much sugar within the blood system, within the bloodstream, with the cells, it causes damage. So people with diabetes have a baseline level of inflammation and damage already. So then when you put in an infection on top of that, the body has a hyper response to it. Not all the time, but in these people who are susceptible. Also individuals who have um, respiratory conditions such as asthma, um, eczema, um, emphysema rather, and COPD, those kinds of things can predispose somebody to get an infection in the first place within the respiratory tract, which can then you know, spread to the rest of the body to become sepsis. So there's a lot a lot more people out there who could be at risk, not just the elderly, so it's important to think about the other populations. Um, in addition, there's a lot of ways for us to prevent ourselves from getting sick, to begin with, from getting these infections that could lead to sepsis. 
And these are the simple, easy things like staying away from somebody who's sick, washing your hands, and being careful about places where you go, like the grocery store, um, public places like um, the movie theater, where you're touching and interacting with other people. Those are times where you really need to make sure you wash your hands so that you don't accidentally give yourself a simple sore throat, which can then escalate to something a whole lot worse um, if you happen to be vulnerable. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, going back, I think three years ago when we had that, that uh, very interesting variant of flu, when all of a sudden now you, you, you get all of these, you know, um, Purell type of hand uh, sanitizers. I mean, we have them all over the university. But, you know, when you really think of it, you know, uh, and you watch the nurse professionals uh, that are in critical care units and ICUs, they're constantly washing in when they're in, washing out when they leave. And that's the reason, because of the the transference of bacterial material, which you don't see, but is there, right. correct? Right, absolutely. So to carry on where Dr. Wallace Ross left off, um, anyone technically is at risk of getting sepsis, but certain individuals are at higher risk. So for the rest of us, the overarching message is prevention and the best way to do that is to keep your hands clean because this is the easiest way for us to auto inoculate so hand hygiene great hand hygiene of soap and water I personally prefer soap and water but if it's not available then I'll go for hand sanitizer but there's also a correct way of doing it so according to the CDC if it's soap and water or hand sanitizer um, you have to scrub your hands in between the fingers the backs of your hands the palms the thumbs are often neglected areas. So scrub it for 15 to 20 seconds and then wash off if it's open water. If it's hand sanitizer, you really want to keep rubbing until it's completely dry. And if you don't do that, if you just wipe it off, it is ineffective. Mm. Yes, so prevention, make sure you have clean hands. How important is that? Um, how often do we touch our faces unknowingly, potentially transferring things to eyes, nose, mouth, easiest way to auto inoculate. They did a study where they showed that without us being aware, we touch our face on an average 25 times in an hour, and we don't even realize we do that. So when I teach microbiology to our medical students, I teach them to get into the habit of not touching your face because we are creatures of habit. So at the end of a long day, if we rub our eyes when we are tired, we'll do that. And if your hands aren't clean, then you've potentially inoculated something. So when we talk about sepsis prevention, let's say for the rest of us, uh, hand hygiene is important, staying current with vaccinations is important. If you have cuts or wounds, like your friend with the gash, I hope he's okay now, but keeping it covered and addressing it properly, either with his own doctor or a wound care specialist, whatever the case may be, but to address it, not to ignore it. If something is red to the touch or if the redness keeps on spreading, that is concerning. So get that looked at by a doctor immediately, sooner rather than later. So there are things we can do to prevent it. And prevention is possible, and I say we should absolutely focus on that. It's a dialogue that even when a patient comes in to see his physician, maybe they could have. It can this infection potentially become sepsis? Here are the warning signs. This is how you should know. And the warning signs, if you were to think of them, is in the spelling of sepsis itself. So the S, the first S could stand for shivering. Um, you have fever or you feel very cold. The E stands for extreme pain or discomfort. Um, it's the worst ever feeling. The P stands for pale or discolored skin. The second S stands for sleepy. The patient is difficult to wake up or they're confused, so there's a change in mental status. The I stands for, I feel like I might die. They feel so horrible. And the last S stands for shortness of breath. So these are all warning signs. And the quicker you realize it and get seen, the better it is. You know, to that issue, uh, and I try to, in, in essence, almost preach to our viewers about the responsibility that they have to see their physicians on a re responsible annual 
basis. Uh, so, I mean, you know, we all feel, especially what I call that, that Superman, Superwoman era, you know, when you have between ages 17 to 45, nothing's going to happen to me. Nothing. Nothing's going to happen. But the reality is, is that <clears throat> so much can be viewed by people who have knowledge, i.e. the physician, uh, and i.e. other individuals, uh, because there are a certain element of prevention, which allows you to fight the incursion of, for example, a, a damaged part of your body or an organ. Correct, Dr. Joe Walsh Ross? Let's, let's hear about what your suggestions is to our people out here relative to seeing their doctors. I would be happy to. And I have spoken um, about prevention and wellness uh, in this venue before. And I just want to recommend to them that they do exactly what you say, regular visits with your physicians, because you really want to know that you're doing the best that you can for yourself, for your longevity, for whatever goals that you have for your personal self. And it's not only about you as well, because certain things that you do for yourself could have an impact on those around you. For instance, if you happen to be a relatively new grandparent and you haven't thought about your tetanus vaccine in a while, you may want to think about getting a tetanus booster because the boosters also protect against pertussis. And your little grandchild could get very, very sick be um, if they contract pertussis before they receive their full immunizations. So when going to your doctor, think about your, the entirety of your scope of your life, who you're in contact with, who you could potentially get sick, who could potentially get you sick, and also what other health concerns do you have. And f find somebody who will follow you on a regular basis to address all of those concerns. And of course, I, I, I want to add to that, and uh, you know, we, it's now a major part of the College of Osteopathic Medicine and other programs is the understanding about nutrition and uh, the res resultant element of what we intake. Everything from food to liquids. Uh, and people just don't know. I mean, you talk about, uh, Dr. Maya, you spoke about uh, the, uh, the, the fluid volume, you know. But, you know, how does your heart really function without having the volume. I mean, you, you cause all kinds of problems relative to the valves themselves. And I'm not, you know, I'm just talking as junkie citizen here. And, you know, the people don't realize, you know, especially in, in warm weather like we have here in South Florida. I mean, people are just not hydrating correctly. They say, oh, well, I drink when I'm thirsty. No, you don't just drink when you're thirsty because your body has not told you until it's in uh, a, a, a dispositive and, and a very difficult point in time, they really need, that the body needs to be hydrated long before you think you're thirsty, correct? You're absolutely right. And the, uh, what, the important point you mentioned was about nutrition. And what proper nutrition does is give you a good gut flora. So now we know that patients who have sepsis or go on to develop sepsis have a different gut flora when you compare them to individuals who didn't get sepsis or healthy, um, healthy individuals, healthy who are not patients. And this is important for us to know because it opens up the avenue for treatment. We already know about fecal transplant for C. diff. Clostridium difficile is um, a life-threatening illness that someone who's been on long-term antibiotics um, and has had frequent medical care can get. So there was a study done that came out of China where they treated two patients. Um, one was 64 and the other one was 50-something, I think, where they did the fecal transplant into these individuals uh, who had sepsis. And not only did it resolve them of sepsis, but it also changed the gut composition and it gave them less sequelae afterwards, those long-term consequences that I was talking about. Now, those were only two individuals, but it highlights the importance of gut flora. And we know enough about the gut microbiome now, the composition of the gut the bacteria and all the other microorganisms in our gut to know that it affects every aspect of our health, from fighting off sepsis perhaps to even our mental well-being. So I cannot underscore the importance of proper nutrition and that of course 
also includes hydration. Yeah. And we're down to the last three minutes of the show. And I want to thank you both for offering some comment to this. I, I know it's a, it might be a very special area, but I felt responsible to try to answer the questions of the people who asked me, what's going on with my, you know, with sep I keep hearing this person going back and going back. But I, I really think, again, you, you both have pointed out that uh, a lot of what occurs can be altered or prevented based upon our own ability to be our own advocates. In other words, it's our responsibility to have our examinations with our physicians. I think that 99% of our physicians are willing to listen to what you have to say. Am I correct, Dr. Jill Wilson? I would hope that the doctors that are out there seeing patients are going to listen to what their doctors, uh, that the doctors will listen to what the patients have to say. And there's an interesting new campaign out there about endometriosis where the woman is hesitant to speak up about her symptoms. And on the commercial it says, you know, tell the doctor the truth. And that's the same for really any symptom that you have especially when it comes to sepsis, because sepsis starts from something that seems like it's nothing, um, or it seems like it's a smaller thing. I have a small urinary tract infection, it's a little bit burning, I'll just wait and see if it gets better. And when we ignore those little things, sometimes they can become the bigger things and that your doctor really needs to know about. So I say report everything to your doctor, let your doctor make heads and tails of what is really important, um, let them ask the questions, to try to figure out exactly what is going on. And if something is just not getting better and it is persisting, be persistent back and put the effort forward to try to get whatever help that you might need. Well, thank you both for being here. We're down to the last 25 seconds of the show. And I want to thank Dr. Jill Wallace-Ross from the Karan C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine and Dr. Bindu Mai. Uh, by the way, congratulations on being a full professor, Thank you. professor of microbiology at our College of Medical Sciences. You've both been a pleasure. I hope, folks, that you got some answers to some of your questions. I know it's been, you know, a little, I was wondering whether we should do a show on this, but really it, it, it relates to caring for yourself. You got to report, you got to talk to your doctors, and you never know what's going to happen. I, I only wish you well, but sometimes if you would let people know a little bit early, it works out. You change the oil in your car every 5,000 miles, well, get to see your doctor at least twice a year. How's about that? That's, that's the last thing that I have to Sounds say. Sounds good to me. Okay, so uh, remember, folks, this is your show. If you have any further thoughts or processes or whatever relative to what you want, there's an a email address and a telephone number right here. And uh, remember, this show is called Dateline Health. It comes to you from Nova Southeastern University. And my name is Fred Lippman. Until next time, see ya. <laughs>